Thank you so much for joining us for today's orientation to Ideals Applied Research Award RFA. My name is Kirsten Tanaflam. I am the senior coordinator for Ideal Small Grants Program. And we have a full hour today, so I won't take too much time. I just wanted to briefly go through some of the platform guidelines. I see a lot of you have already begun to introduce yourselves in the chat. Thank you for doing that. We'll be using that chat box for any communications and to share resources and links during the webinar. We ask that you post any questions for the presenters during the presentations in the Q&A box rather than in the chat box. This box should be located at the bottom of your Zoom window. There's a Q&A and it has two chat bubbles as the icon. And these questions will be answered during the Q&A session. Um, if you are scrolling through that box before then and you see a question that you resonate with, you can upvote it by clicking the thumbs up and we'll make sure that this question gets prioritized during our Q&A and a comprehensive document with all of the questions and answers will be sent out after the webinar. Next slide, please, Julia. Uh, as a brief introduction, again, I'm Kirsten Tanafum, the Senior Coordinator for the Small Grants Program with IDEAL. You'll also be hearing from Karen Romano, who is the IDEAL Activity Director, Austin Musso, who's the Small Grants Manager for IDEAL, and Joan Whalen, who is the Senior Learning Advisor for USAID's Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance. And with that, I would like to hand it over to our Director, Karen Romano, for an agenda and a little background on IDEAL. Thanks so much, Kirsten. So first of all, welcome again, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us today. We're really excited to launch IDEAL's first applied research award RFA on this important theme of strategic integration within food security programming. We designed the Applied Research Award in response to a need expressed by food security implementers for more user-friendly research that's practical and program-oriented. This award will provide a great opportunity for researchers and implementers to team up on practical research that can make a real difference in food security programming. We at IDEAL are looking forward to closer collaboration with the research community through this award mechanism and to seeing what new knowledge this award can help generate. So for today's agenda, we'll start with a quick overview of IDEAL. We'll then share some information on our overall small grants program that this RFA is part of. We'll then highlight some key elements of this new Applied Research Award RFA. And after that, our panel member from BHA will speak about the food security learning agenda and on the theme of strategic integration. And we'll follow that with question and answer for 15 minutes. So that will be a great chance for you to interact with us, the panelists, to ask whatever questions you have. Next slide, please. So IDEAL is an acronym and it stands for Implementer-Led Design, Evaluation, Analysis and Learning. The activity is funded by USAID's Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance or BHA, and it builds on the highly successful USAID TOPS program that many of you are familiar with. The duration is for five years from 2018 to 2023. And IDEAL is delivered by a consortium that's led by Save the Children and includes the Kaizen Company, Mercy Corps, and Tango International. The goal of IDEAL is to improve the overall effectiveness of BHA-funded development and emergency food security activities. We do that through four primary modalities. First is peer-to-peer -peer learning that we facilitate through activities such as knowledge sharing meetings, communities of practice, and topic-specific learning events. An example of this is our COVID-19 learning series that many of you have participated in. Another modality is capacity strengthening, through which we provide food security implementers with tools and approaches to develop their own capacity and to strengthen the capacity of their local partners on, for example, themes such as theory of change and monitoring and evaluation. Our small grants program provides funds to implementers to test out new ideas and generate learning that can be useful for the wider food security community. And last, stakeholder, consultation, stakeholder consultations, through which IDEAL creates structured opportunities for implementers and BHA to directly engage with each other on critical issues affecting food security programming. So I'll make two last points about IDEAL. So the first is to live up to our name as implementer-led, we really strive to make sure that all of our activities are guided by the voice of food security implementers themselves and are in alignment with BHA's priorities. And IDEAL, unlike some other mechanisms, we uniquely focus on cross-activity and cross-regional learning, learning and capacity development that has import for the entire food security community, rather than focusing on strengthening just individual uh, food security programs. 
So that's my very quick overview of IDEAL. Um, to learn more about IDEAL, I invite you to explore the FSN network link that is going to be pasted into the chat box right now. And with that short introduction, I'll hand over to Austin to tell you more about our small grants program and this Applied Research Award RFA. Thank you, Karen. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, glad to have you with us to learn about the most recent IDEAL small grant opportunity. I know many of the attendees are new to the IDEAL Small Grants Program, so I want to provide you with a brief background on this. As a program, we seek to fund food security implementing partners to address knowledge and capacity gaps that you are experiencing through your daily work in the field. In 2019, we released our first two requests for applications, with the first being the, called the microgrants, which were for awards up to $50,000, and the second was focused on program improvement awards to $100,000 per award. We received an outstanding number of applications, 286 applications through, through these first two RFAs. And we've worked carefully since to vet the applications and pursue just the strongest activities that will generate new tools, events, and approaches related to IDEAL's content focus areas. The charts on the screen show the current status of the remaining applications with some awarded, others in it being currently approved, and a few that are in the final steps of vetting. Of those awards that are approved or awarded at this point, they represent 13 different organizations receiving these subawards, and they're implementing in a variety of different countries throughout Asia, Latin America, and Africa. While many grants are now being finalized, I do want to quickly express my appreciation for the patience of those food security implementers that applied for these first grants. Vetting did take longer than we expected for a variety of reasons. COVID-19, starting right in the middle of the vetting process, certainly added a month or two for most applications. We really appreciate the patience, and we're currently analyzing all the steps in our review processes so we can make the application vetting process faster and less burdensome for everyone. When developing this Applied Research Award RFA, we worked to adapt the scoring criteria and weights to more quickly identify the best applications. Additionally, we've removed the concept note phase from the Applied Research Award to make the process less burdensome for successful applicants. This will be the, when thinking about this award, please note this will be the one Applied Research Award RFA that we plan to release. But you can expect other small grant RFAs released by a deal in 2020 and 2021. So at the end of this hour, if you find that the Applied Research Award just isn't the right fit for your organization, you will have other opportunities for small grants through the FSN network in the future. So please do stay tuned, continue to engage with us. Next slide, please. So we developed this Applied Research Award mechanism with the following goals in mind. First and foremost, we want to fund research that contributes to an evidence base for best practices in food and nutrition security programming. This is a common theme throughout IDEAL's mechanisms. We want to increase knowledge and figure out best practices. This was, mechanism was specifically designed to allow sufficient resources and time for implementers in partnership with research institutions to undertake robust research and learning that's typically not feasible not feasible because of overhead funds or not feasible because of the cooperative agreements that we find ourselves in. So we allowed additional funding as well as a longer time frame, up to 24 months to conduct this work. Whereas previous awards, some awards through the small grants program were at a maximum of 12 months. This applied research award RFA focuses on addressing lines of inquiry around strategic integration of food and nutrition security programming. Many implementers out there are already working to sequence, layer, and integrate their food security activities in the field, but globally there are knowledge gaps in these areas, and we often don't fully understand what approaches are working best and why they're working most effectively. The research activities that you will develop can address those gaps by examining both past and current food security activities. Lastly, we aimed to generate and strengthen partnerships between research institutions, higher education institutes, and food security implementers through this Applied Research Award. We believe these partnerships can facilitate both current and long-term strategic learning and adaptive management that helps the global food security implementing community. Next slide, please. If you haven't read through our full RFA yet, I want to highlight a few details so you can identify if this might be the right fit for your organization. First, the most important things off the bat, we're looking at up to five total awards at a maximum for up to $300,000 each. Each application will require a partnership between a food security and nutrition implementing organization 
and a research institution or higher education institute. Definitions for these organization types can be found in the RFA. Each organization brings different strengths to play in this partnership, and we're excited to see how organizations will choose to partner around these research topics. We see the implementers bringing practical knowledge from the field, understanding what the communities really need, and helping to ground the approaches and the end results. Meanwhile, the research partner brings their research expertise to ensure rigorous methods are applied to generate impactful learnings and recommendations that can benefit the global food security community. You should also keep in mind with these awards that food security implementing organizations can only be part of one applied research award application, regardless if they are the lead applicant or if they are just written on as the secondary um, partner. So a research institution or a higher education institute can be part of multiple applications by contrast. So please do keep that in mind. Implementers should try to identify their best one idea and work with their identifying a research partner that can help align with those goals. All research must address knowledge gaps across strategic integration and food security and nutrition activities, themes of interest. Specifically, the sub-themes include the optimal package of interventions, joint action, and responding to both acute and chronic need. Joan Whalen will speak about each of these topics in the next section of the webinar. When you're thinking about these three sub-themes, please keep in mind that we don't want to try to address all three. We saw this in the last RFA where we saw people that tried to apply a project for seven different content focus areas at one time, and this is really not our goal. Your application should focus just on one important gap or line of inquiry and really work to move the needle in that area. Lastly, I do want to note that there is a preference for partnering with research institutions and higher education institutes headquartered in developing countries. We found that local institutions were underrepresented in past RFAs under both the ideal activity and TOPS program, and this is of concern. As, we, as you look at the scoring criteria, you will see that the applications that partner with researchers headquartered in what USAID considers developing countries will receive an additional five points in their scoring process. Next slide, please. Thank you, Julia. If you're thinking about this funding opportunity and think it might be right for you, please do keep these dates in mind. First, the full application will be due on October 16th. There are no concept note required. So on the 16th, we'll be looking for a narrative of up to 10 pages maximum, along with the required budget documents. When you submit those, you should have a written letter of support from the partner organization. So if the lead is the implementing organization, uh, such as uh, CARE, for example, applies, then the partner um, should have, which is the researcher, would submit a letter of support to go along with that application. We aim to identify the top 10 applications by January 2021. So everyone knows where they stand at that point. We'll alert all the other applicants. They're no longer being considered at that, at that period. The overall date of target for award would be March 30th, 2021. That gives us about five months total. So when you're planning your work plan and when potential funding could start and be received, look at April 2021. As you're writing the narrative, please do keep in mind that these are cost reimbursable subawards following USAID financial principles. This means the organization will need to spend their own funds to conduct this work and will be reimbursed every three months through the subaward mechanism after submitting financial reporting. This is a common mechanism used by the USAID community for subawards, but we know not everyone is familiar with it. So please do keep that in mind if you're considering applying. The total award length for this applied research award is 24 months. And this includes time for research, report writing, report review by the ideal team and dissemination. You can submit a shorter work plan if you'd like um, and if your research methods allow for it, uh, but we will only consider a maximum of 24 months in length. Thus, we expect each award to close no later than April 1st, 2023. Also keep in mind with these that quarterly reporting will be required to facilitate those quarterly payments. Next slide, please. We've received a number of questions asking about eligibility and you're, what you're seeing here comes directly from the RFA. So I would highly encourage you to look through the RFA and determine how you fit into the eligibility criteria. I will briefly summarize though. 
in saying that applications must be submitted by an implementing organization and in partnership with a research institution or higher education institute. As I've mentioned, either of these entities can be the lead applicant. Whoever is the lead organization must have the Duns and Bradstreet number, uh, SAM registration when applying, and the lead will be responsible for ensuring their partner follows all USAD regulations through the research implementation period. At least one of the partners should be legally recognized in the country where they're actively conducting the research, so keep that in mind. Additionally, research should only be conducted in or focused on countries where the Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance currently funds activities or has funded activities in the past five years through the Office of Food for Peace or previous Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance. When you're developing research methods, it's really important to take COVID-19 into mind. We know there's a lot of uncertainty in the future. And so when making assumptions, please assume that the situation is going to stay where it is and that we're not going to see drastic improvements. Um, so assume that things like large amounts of international travel and large in-person workshops might not be the right approach. Um, if the situation improves over the next few months before the award is made, recipients will have the flexibility to adjust aspects of their work plan um, to allow new mechanisms, such as more in-person data collection, for example. But for the, I would recommend um, being conservative when it comes to planning your methodologies around COVID-19. In the chat box, we are posting a few links to the most recent COVID-19 resources that have been put out by USAID. And these should be considered as you're developing your application and the methodologies. Additionally, we're releasing guidance that has been shared from the Bureau for Humanitarian Spe Assistance specifically on both development and humanitarian content. Please review those as you have time and take them into consideration. You'll find the next list of non-eligible entities in the RFA. These entities are not eligible as a food security implementing organization or as the research partner on the application. I do want to be clear, this does include the ideal consortium partners, such as Save the Children and Mercy Corps, Tango, and Kaizen Company. That includes country offices and fundraising offices, not just the U.S. location. So everyone will not be eligible from our consortium members to receive any funds through this award mechanism. Your research might involve data that's coming from government programs, that's coming from UN-funded programs, or uh, a Mercy Corps-funded program, you know, a Mercy Corps-led program but the individual ideal members should not be receiving funding through this award. I hope that's clear, but we're happy to answer questions on that if there are more later. We know many organizations will not be eligible um, based on these restrictions. And if you do see knowledge gaps and know how to address them, we do invite you to please share these ideas with partner organizations. The learnings that come from the Applied Research Award will be shared globally and benefit everyone. So even if you are not funded to conduct the work, you can still help get quality research implemented and shared with the community. Next slide, please. This is my last slide. And based on the experience with the first request for applications, I wanted to share just a few tips um, that I thought would be helpful for consideration. IDEAL has a rigorous review process and you will be competing, if you apply, you will be competing against a number of strong applications. So it's important you consider these things as you're applying. The first is just a reality, and um, you know that is applicants are not required to have USAID funding experience to be eligible for this award. But we have to be honest that we have found that understanding USAID regulations and knowledge around BHA strategies can be a significant advantage to applicants. You know this knowledge and comfort with BHA activities, which was formerly the Office of Food for Peace and Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance often shows up in the background of your application, but is also naturally reflected in the project description, research justification, dissemination plan. You're often just speaking the same language when you have experience in these areas as the reviewers and the donor. So with that said, if your organization doesn't have experience but you're with USAID, but you're interested, I would highly recommend the resources that are put out by USAID's new partnership initiative as you're developing the application there's a training package from the new partnership initiative that is gonna be shared in the chat box. Another thing to keep in mind is that we do require research is implemented in countries where BHA works or has worked in the past five years, or we say has funded programs in the past five years. This is really a minimum standard. 
if you're looking to strengthen your application, you can target countries where BHA currently operates and has an actively strong portfolio. This ensures the applicability of your learnings to the broader food and nutrition security activity. You know, you absolutely can apply for research in a country where perhaps OFTA has done one humanitarian project a few years ago, but it just might not be as strong as others that are applying for in more focused areas. Third, applicants should ensure that knowledge gaps and final results that they're exploring really benefit the global food and nutrition security community. You heard Karen speak to this earlier. As with all the ideal small grants opportunities, the knowledge gain should not just help the specific grant recipient or their target beneficiaries in the community. The knowledge should really be benefiting the global food security community and help everyone to work more effectively to integrate their activities. If you can review the food assistance and food security agenda, which is gonna be spoken to by Joan Whalen in a few minutes, you're gonna naturally be on the right track because the ideas and lines of inquiry in there are all of high value to the global community. So stay close to that and I think you'll make sure this point is hit. Lastly, I wanted to encourage everyone to explore the model of embedded research translation. Our friends at the Laser Pulse Activity are leading the discussion around research translation, and we believe it's extremely valuable to understand as you're developing research partnerships and composing your applications. The team at Laser Pulse defines embedded research translation as an iterative co-design process among academics, practitioners, and other stakeholders in which research is intentionally applied to development challenges. The core aspects of this can be seen in the four pillars. We have partnership, process, product, and dissemination. You'll especially see the themes of partnership and dissemination highlighted throughout our RFA, but the whole model really should be looked at as you're developing these partnerships um, and selecting research questions. In the chat box, I'm gonna post a link for Laser Pulse's resources on research translation so you can get familiar with this model and think about how it could help in this application or future research applications. So with that introduction to the Applied Research Award RFA, I'm now going to hand the presentation to Joan Whalen from the Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance. Thank you. Thanks, Austin. Um, and again, this is Joan Whalen. I'm the Senior Learning Advisor with the Bureau of uh, Humanitarian Assistance. I was formerly with uh, the Office of Food for Peace, or Food for Peace uh, is now part of uh, BHA. And I was involved in the development of the um, food assistance and food security programmatic learning agenda. And I just wanted to familiar, provide a little bit of an overview today because as Austin has noted, um, we are asking applicants to align their research priorities, their research ideas with the learning agenda that um, the former Office of Food for Peace put together in a very long-term consultative process um, over the course of more than a year that involved reaching out to key academics in the food security realm. It involved uh, consultations with USAID staff around the globe and also um, some in-depth conversation with implementing partners through key informant interviews, but also a large uh, community event with more than 180 attendees having the opportunity to weigh in on priority themes and some of the specific questions um, under, under those themes. But first I wanna step back and, um, next slide please, step back and just uh, talk through a little bit about why a learning agenda is important. And in a nutshell, it's really that we all have learned that it is important that we, we take explicit steps, intentional steps to understand what's working and what's not working, what approaches are going to be the most effective and efficient for us over the long term. And, and as a result, this is a really good thing that there are a multitude of food security and humanitarian response actors who engage in a variety of different research activities in the food security realm whether it's donor agencies, academic researchers, implementing partners, civil society organizations, national governments, there are a lot of people working to try to answer really fundamental questions. But how do we make sure it all adds up, right? That, that, that we are prioritizing and really looking at the, you know, as Austin noted, how do we make sure that we're answering questions that are gonna move the needle for us? So um, what a learning agenda can do, and next slide, please. Um, I'll, I'll give you the definition from the US government definition from the Office of Management and Budget. Um, a learning agenda is a broad set of questions directly related to the work that an agency conducts that when answered enables the agency to work more effectively and efficiently, particularly pertaining to evaluation, evidence, and decision making. 
Once the questions are identified, a learning agenda also prioritizes and establishes a plan to answer short and long-term questions of the highest value across relevant program and policy areas. So, um, in essence, what a learning agenda does is help us to prioritize what are those, those questions that across the spectrum of the food security community, what are those questions that are the most important? What are the themes that emerge that are really that people are grappling with where there's a clear evidence and knowledge gap where answering those questions would help to propel us forward um, with better better um, design and better implementation of our programs and better results. So a learning agenda helps to prioritize um, these themes and helps to prioritize um, the key lines of inquiry um, under each. And they can really, a learning activity, as the slide notes, um, they can really run the gamut from large scale randomized control trials to um, more informal learning for the purposes of uh, this uh, applied research um, uh, grant program through IDEAL, we are looking at things on the research spectrum rather than the, um, the more experiential learning spectrum. So next slide, please. Back to our food assistance and food security programmatic learning agenda, it is linked in the RFA and I really do urge each of you to read it and to understand both uh, the whole spectrum of, of themes that have emerged through this process that are important and that where we need to really um, move forward around evidence and knowledge in this community, but particularly around theme four, strategic integration, because it will really help you to understand the language um, that we collectively are using, the themes that emerge through this consultative process as being the highest priority in terms of evidence and knowledge gaps, and the, the key lines of inquiry that are under each. Um, and you'll find um, the, the learning agenda is written in a narrative format. It is written in very broad terms that is really helping to, again, prioritize what's a very, very large universe of evidence and knowledge gaps because it is meant to be a user-friendly guide where whether or not you are a, a higher education institution or research organization, whether you're working with a national government, whether you're an implementing partner looking at you know, operations research, implementation research in your own activity, you can tailor, you can look at these key lines of inquiry and tailor the specific questions that you're going to ask to your context and to your operating environment. So um, it really is meant to be adaptable, it, to provide framing and, um, and a look at, at prioritization of evidence um, generation, but it's meant to be really flexible and, and, and allow you the space to tailor it to your own context. So what do we mean by strategic integration? I mean, I think that's a really important question um, to spend some time on today, just so that we're all talking about the same thing. Um, and next slide, please. Strategic integration can mean um, a lot of things to a lot of different people, and uh, we recognize that. But for the purposes of the learning agenda, um, and again, you'll find this if you, if you do uh, read this theme, um, we do apply a particular and very broad definition of what we mean by strategic integration. Um, those of you that work in the resilience space understand the phrase sequencing, integration, and layering. We, we intend for this uh, learning agenda theme to encompass all of these. Sequencing is, um, is really, it can happen within an activity, between, between activities, with the government, but it's making sure that you um, focus on how to meet populations and their needs where they are over time and to really make sure that interventions and activities themselves are sequenced so that as capabilities emerge that that there is support to those capabilities that as new needs emerge there is support to meeting those needs and so it's really working with populations as as um, their change needs change in a very dynamic environment. Multi-sectoral integration is um, really looking at how do we connect activities and interventions across sectors, across approaches, and really looking at, at um, you know, what is happening, how do we make sure that, 
that working across interventions, working across sectors, that we're looking at a package of interventions that is synergistic and mutually reinforcing. And then meanwhile, layering of interventions um, allows us the space to meet acute and chronic needs within, um, within a population because the populations we work with, if you are familiar with our programs, you know that, that they are often dealing with a complex set of um, shocks and stresses they are dealing with, um, just as there are you know, multiple opportunities to work with populations and meet their, um, their acute needs and their chronic needs both. So I'll go into a little bit more um, uh, detail about this theme. Um, something that's important to note is that under this theme of strategic integration are three lines of inquiry. And um, Austin did mention them, but let me repeat, and I'll walk you e through each of these um, in a moment. Uh, the three lines of inquiry are the optimal package of interventions, joint action, and responding to both acute and chronic need. So next slide, please. And I know this is a lot to take in. So again, I urge you to please pick up the text um, because it is all written there, um, written down, and it will give you more chance to read and just absorb um, what is meant, the language that's being used, the nuance around, around all of these. But the first key line of inquiry is the optimal package of interventions. And this is really looking at, um, it, it, it's about the number of interventions and it's about the optimal package, the interactions across interventions. So this key line, of, key line of inquiry addresses really fundamental issues that where we need more evidence, we need more understanding, we need more knowledge around what works and doesn't work and in a context specific way around how do we best address the breadth of needs that are out there while also programming in a way that allows us, uh, you know, programming deeply enough in intervention areas, in sectors, in approaches that allows us to have impact. So this question of breadth versus depth is a very, very, very challenging one where we need much more evidence. Um, how do we prioritize needs in, in, in order to do so? How do we look at the interactions across interventions where you know some packages of interventions may deliver incredible synergies while others may deliver us unintended negative consequences that we really didn't didn't foresee <clears throat> there are questions of time poverty that when we try to address too many needs at once um you know we really put a burden on the participants that we are working with meanwhile there are questions around absorptive capacity as well so um, finally, I think this, the learning agenda addresses the question around, you know, what are, are there foundational interventions for particular populations or based on particular contexts where there are foundational interventions that can really um, help deliver a solid base of change that will allow more transformative change if we build upon it. Um, next uh, slide, please. Okay. The second key line of inquiry is around joint action. And this, this key line of inquiry is much more process oriented, management oriented. It's really looking at um, the spectrum from design to implementation um, and, and including m and &E and all aspects of, of the program cycle. Um, but how do we strive for collective impact in a more intentional and focused and practiced manner and, and what, evidence can we gain about best practices in doing so? And this ranges, um, you know, joint targeting. There are, you know, big evidence gaps around best practices and joint targeting strategies. So there may be different targeting criteria that you need to use while when you're working with um, meeting both acute and chronic needs or working across sectors and across intervention areas. Um, how do you manage interdependencies um, across interventions, across sectors, across, um, across mechanisms, whether in terms of timing, quality, effectiveness, that there are, like, collective impact requires us to be dependent on others and the work they carry out. How do we best manage touch points as participants move through sequenced interventions and support them and make sure that we understand how their needs are changing over time? And also, you know, fundamental to joint action is cross-intervention communication and knowledge sharing. Um, 
and finally managing, which includes managing for coordination. And, and you know, what evidence do we have around best practices? What can we do to build the practice of something that increasingly we are, we are understanding is fundamental to, um, to um, achieving food security impact? Okay, so final, final line of inquiry under strategic integration. Uh, next slide, please is responding to both acute and chronic need. And this one is again, looking at um, what is the right mix of interventions? How do you get that balance right? Where, you know, you, you need to meet acute need to keep populations from falling. You need to meet chronic need in order to move populations forward. What is that right mix given different contexts um, and given, you know, different different spectrums of need. What are the unintended consequences if we don't get the balance right? Um, again, there are targeting issues involved in, um, you know, this dual hatted, um, you know, addressing needs uh, in both ways, in both levels. And this uh, key line of inquiry also includes how do we best manage a pivot to rapid response? Because there's a world of management issues, there's a world of operational issues and um, activity design and implementation issues involved in, in managing a pivot like that, including how staffing up um, and models for staffing for, um, you know, meeting sudden, meeting a rapid response that's necessary and, 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 and requiring a, a shift to an emergency footing, for example. There may be modality shifts. Um, there may be adaptations needed to interventions and, and, you know, and we saw this in, um, you know, the rise of, of uh, you know, meeting needs around uh, COVID-19, that there had to be some large scale adaptations to interventions. There had to be rethinking, how do we look at vulnerability for these populations? How do we change our operations, um, change our staffing, change um, how we carry out our work in order to meet needs in this changing context? So I know that was a lot, um, but again, I stress, please, um, it's, it's only about a page and a half or maybe two or three pages of text. Have a look at it because it's really going to provide you a strong foundation for um, addressing um, this RFA. And with that, um, my remarks are finished and I will turn it over to Kirsten, who is going to lead us through a Q&A session. Thanks, everyone. Great. Thank you, Joan. Um, it's really wonderful to hear from you and have more information around the learning agenda and strategic integration. And as she mentioned for this last session, I'll be calling on Joan and Austin and Karen to come back and answer some of your questions. Um, while they're getting back on, just as a reminder to everyone, the open ended question, open question period ended on August 31st. So this is the final opportunity for you to answer, to ask your questions. And any questions that are not addressed live will be answered in the FAQ document released hopefully later this week. Um, again, please put all of your questions in the Q&A box. And if there's a question that you want to ask that has already been asked, you can just use a thumbs up button to upvote it. And we have everyone back. Okay. Um, the first question is from Nikki Shrestha, and we have a few questions around this, wanting to uh, understand better the partnership between the research institution and the implementing organization. So I think, Austin, this is probably more for you. Is it possible for the research institution to lead? Because in the presentation, it was mentioned the application is to be submitted by an implementing organization in partnership with the research institution. Yeah, good question. I apologize, I wasn't clear on this. Uh, yes, the research institution or higher education institute can be the lead on the application process. Um, if they are the lead, that means they would be the direct recipient of the subaward and the subaward funds um, directly through the ideal activity. So that's where it's important that they ensure they are registered and have a DUNS number, have uh, are connected with the system of award management and registered on there so that they can receive those funds and have all the necessary checks and balances in place. Thank you, Austin. And as a follow-up question um, from Bacoli, which also received a thumbs up, what is a DUNS number and a SAMS registration? Yes, DUNS and Bradstreet number is something commonly used by the US government uh, for all organizations that receive funding from them. 
Uh, we can put a link to the Duns and Bradstreet website, which these are free for any entity to apply for to receive them so that they can work with the federal government or receive federal government funds. Um, a similar thing for the system for award management, um, uh, SAM.gov, and it's another registration process that you need to go through again to be engaged with uh, funding from the US government. Uh, but feel free to, Karen, Joan, feel free to add if there's any other details on that. Okay, thank you. Um, again, Austin, I think this question might be for you and Karen, Joan, I'm sure you can step in, but the food security activities being studied should they already be in progress when we apply or can the research be planned for a future program? I can speak to that and Karen, if you wanna add any more, feel free. Um, I think the original intent, the original thought behind this was, you know, given it's just a 24 month period and there's a lot of work to do, was that the work would have, be, have been completed or currently ongoing, the actual activities that would be being researched. Um, I couldn't see potential situations where something is just about to start, where the funds are committed to an activity and it's going to be researched during that, but it just makes it more complicated, obviously, during a 24 month period to make sure all the research um, is, make sure the activity is completed in that same timeline. Um, so we don't have a clear restriction on it. I would just say the original intent was thinking more past and um, current activities, but it, we we're open to suggestions and applications. Yeah, and I also think that with the level of funding, it just doesn't seem realistic to try to launch an intervention through this mechanism and study it in the time frame. So I think we discourage against that, but we're not completely ruling it out. Um, thank you again around the organizations. How many organizations can make a partnership for this application? We don't have an official limit on that. Um, it's obviously going to be restricted by funding and overhead resources. So it can be yeah, a whole variety of different organizations. The minimum for a partnership is just two. Um, but if you wanted to work in a variety of different countries with a lot of small partners doing small pieces, that could be, could be feasible. It just all has to happen within that 24 month period. Thank you, Austin. Um, Joan, I don't know if you have any more information around this, but this question is from Daniela. Where can I find the list of countries where BHA has current or past funded projects? On USA.gov, there is a, a page for BHA. Maybe somebody could post the link. Uh, and it's in the RFA as well. Okay. We good. can put the link in the RFA. Yeah, good. Um, thank you, Joan. Again, around uh, this partnership, can all of the partners be in the same country or do, do they have to be? And the other question I think somebody else had asked is, um, can the submitting organization be registered outside the country where the implementation is being done? I'm trying to think what we have written in the RFA. Um, so we'll, have, we'll make sure to respond to all these in full in the frequently asked questions, but based on how I'm understanding it, Yes, there could be two organizations both registered in the same country, if that's where the, where the work is going to be done. Um, the lead organization might not be registered in the country where the work is going to be done because their partner, the research institution, is registered in that specific country and has the necessary approvals, can go through the IRB process as needed in country. So no, technically the one lead entity, whether that be the HEI, the research institution, or the partner, doesn't necessarily need to be registered in the country if its partner is then registered in the target country. Does that make sense? Any answer the question? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, and again, Austin, I think this is for you. Um, a question from Bieta. Should the research be necessarily spread over 24 months? Can it be implemented over 18 months, for instance, or is there a preference um, for ideal in terms of the duration of the research? I'm gonna to have to refer back to the RFA. I believe we put in some guidance regarding the maximum time period for actually conducting the research because we do wanna make sure to allow time for report writing, report reviewing and dissemination. So I believe the guidance in the RFA and you'll be, I'll be able to re reference that, I believe it's in section B, um, is speaking that actual research and data collection should be a maximum of 18 months to allow for these other actions to take place during the life of the award. Dissemination, as we talked about, um, is such a key aspect, making sure these learnings are applicable for everyone. 
uh, making sure you're creating a final research product. We don't want the report being written after the award officially closes out. So um, yes, the, the actual research um, it should not be 24 months because there's so many other pieces that are coming into play. Um, the research could just be, you know, the actual research and data collection could just be 12 months. It could be six months. You know, it can be a variety of different lengths that are that are required to get the work done. Karen, anything yeah. you add to that? Just if you look at table one in the RFA, we just, we presented an illustrative timeline that seems realistic based on things like startup, IRB approval, you know, and it does seem like the window for actual data collection analysis, et cetera, it's closer to 12 to 18 months to do all the things at the front end and the back end. But just take a good look at that table, consider it for your own context as you develop the RFA. Thank you both. Um, I'm gonna leave this question open to either Karen or Austin, but it's gotten a lot of upvotes. And it's from Dan asking, could you please clarify what constitutes longitudinal research? Um, are studies that primarily seek to compare different interventions or exposures but include before or after analyses acceptable. For example, if a project were to test different interventions in different districts and took measurements before and after the different exposures in each district, would this constitute a longitudinal study in ideals view? Is this design acceptable? Yeah, so Dan, we, we saw this question. I believe you guys submitted it as well by email. Uh, this is something we need to explore a little bit further. In the RFA, we said that might not be suitable for this type of longitudinal research. I think the original idea was just thinking of timelines, how this would be done for a longitudinal study. But given, given the questions are being asked, we realize we need to explore this more closely with our research advisors. So we'll have a full response to that that's going to be submitted through the frequently asked questions. I don't want to try to approach it here and say something inappropriate. So thank you for your patience. I, I would interjected first glance it does not sound like he was describing longitudinal research um, which my understanding is that that would require um, going back and and gathering data from exactly the same population that was um, that was um, contacted at the beginning but uh, uh, before and after taking measurements before and after um, targeted interventions in targeted areas um, it, that design itself is, of course, um, acceptable. Maybe can we get more clarity on the use of longitudinal in the question then? Because yeah. pre-post is expected, but what's the, how are we differentiating that from longitudinal? You're asking the, the participant who asked the question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. or if the questions, because I know we had how the question was phrased. We can't see it, um, but how the question was phrased, does it give us some more insight into the, how they're defining longitudinal in the question? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I agree. Dan, I don't know if you want to add on to anything. While we wait, mm -hmm. um, there is a question from Mara Russell, which again, I'll leave open to you. Is it possible to conduct research work on a project not, not funded by BHA as long as the research is in a country where BHA has had a project in the country over the past five years? Uh, yes, there's, we haven't set any restrictions on uh, who has funded the activity, um, but obviously making sure it was done in a BHA country, making sure the model and the approach that's being used are similar to what's being done by the BHA and USAID are obviously really important points to make sure the learnings are applicable um, and can easily be applied to the, the community. But yeah, so GIFID funded, Gates funded, we, we have not set any restrictions on that point. Thank you. Um, another question that has been upvoted a few times, is it possible to get a list of projects funded before as a reference? Austin, I think. So this RFA is rather unique. We haven't funded, we haven't done an applied research where in the past. We have done the micro grants and the PAAs, as I mentioned earlier, but they were uh, very different, much more targeted, not going after necessarily a research question in the same manner. I don't think they'd necessarily be applicable, but with that said, we are working to get those online. We do release these through the newsletter when awards are made. So if you follow the newsletter, you will see some updates, but unfortunately there's not, we, since we haven't done this mechanism before, there's not a list of things that are, that are gonna give you good examples of it. I just have to reference, reference the RFA and, and especially some of the comments that Joan has made when thinking about um, the aspects of the learning agenda that we wanna to try to address. Okay, and we've got a response from Dan. He said, it sounds like from Joan's definition 
a study that collects data pre-intervention and post-intervention would be okay. So I think our question was answered. Thank you. Yeah, but it makes me wonder how we define longitudinal in the RFA. So maybe we have to take a quick look at that and be sure that we're clear and we're not confusing people. So when we do that, we, when we might issue a further clarification in the uh, frequently asked questions. So thanks for the question, Dan. Thank you. Um, I think there, I don't know if this has been answered clearly enough yet, but I'm just going to put it out there again so people can have more clarification if needed. But it's again around the partnership between the research and development NGO. Um, I think this is the most, could they have more of an explanation about this? Should the partnership comprise of each organization from the list that's a security, food and nutrition security program implementer and an established research team from a higher education institute? So a partnership just has to involve two different entities. Um, so we said one is a food security implementing organization, or that's their primary focus as an organization. And then one would be this research partner. And as that research partner, we have said that is a higher education institute or a research institution. So it just needs, you know, one food security implementer and then either an HEI or a research institution. So that would be kind of the minimum partnership. Does that address the question? I can't see it, Christian. I think, I think so, yes. And somebody had a similar question around um, how the partnership would work if one of them was located in a developing country and the other one was located in, for instance, the UK. I think it's fine, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's no restriction, right, Austin? There's no restriction on that, yeah. Okay. Um, Let's see, a lot of these questions are quite similar to that. Could I just answer Camille's question really quickly? We'll only take a minute. She asked, why is theme four strategic integration the only theme highlighted in the food assistance and food security program learning agenda? And that is just because it, that theme itself, as you heard today, is so extremely broad but it's also, it also represents some of the most priority, like the biggest areas where we really do need more evidence. We have enormous evidence that sequencing, layering, and integration are fundamental to our achieving results, but there's so much evidence that we don't have about how to do so in the best manner based on context. And it is something that we felt, it was also a theme that we felt was still highly relevant given um, this very dynamic universe that we're in um, today, um, working in COVID-19 affected environments, um, that it is something regardless of the trajectory of the pandemic, it will still be a relevant theme. And so there were multiple reasons, but it was a desire for focus. Thank you, John. Um, probably have time for a couple more questions. Um, I'll ask this one from Swapnil. What criteria qualifies an institution as a food security institution? Is it to do with the number of years, published work? No, Karen if, or Austin. <laughs> specific criteria, but I think the, the issue is, are you working in food security? Are you implementing food security programs? And are they generally in the same universe of the types of food security work that the HA funds and that BHA is prioritizing. So, um, yeah, I don't think we can be more prescriptive than that, you know, food security, nutrition, in the realm of activities that BHA tends to prioritize. Does that sound good to you, John? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you both. Um, maybe take this last question. I think we've touched on this, but again, it's been uploaded a few times, so can the HEI higher education institutions submit more than one application with the same partner or with separate partners? So what we put in the RFA is the HEI can submit multiple applications, but the implementing organization, implementing organizations cannot submit multiple applications. So thus, yeah, an HEI could submit a few different applications, but they'd have to be with different food security implementing partners each time. And Austin, that assumes the HEI is not the lead, right? Because what we're saying is if they're in a supporting role, then they can be on multiple bids. Is that what we're saying? No, no. I don't think that, I don't think it plays in. Okay, so they can be on multiple bids as an HEI. Correct. Okay. Yep, regardless of what level it is. Okay. Or research institution. Or research institution, correct. 
think we actually have a little bit of time to take this last question. Um, Austin, Karen, Joan, I think any of you can answer this. Is there an ideal repartition of funds across the partners? If an intervention is already funded, would it be acceptable that the large majority of the funding goes for research? I'm guessing rather than the implementation. Can you rephrase that? I didn't, I didn't get that one. One more time. Um, is there an ideal repartition of funds across the partners? If an intervention is already funded, would it be acceptable that the large majority of the funding goes for research? I think it's totally up to the applicant to, to figure that out. Where is the money needed to get the job done? That's the key question. Um, I mean, in many ways, I think this could work best if it's layered onto an activity that's already funded. It adds a supplemental layer of inquiry, of learning. Um, in many ways, I think this could work very well if it's added onto an already funded uh, activity. Um, given, the, given the funding envelope of these awards, I, I would think that much of the implementation would need to be funded through another source. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, this in many ways should be resources to help you do that additional inquiry that you don't get a chance to do through the grant itself that you have or through the through the mechanism that's funding the work you're doing on the ground. This gives you a breathing space, financial breathing space and the ability to focus on on lines of inquiry that maybe you can't in your in your work plan or in your your daily work. Wonderful. Well, Kirsten, thank you for arranging that session. I think that's all the time we have to dedicate today. Uh, if we didn't get to certain questions, uh, they will be answered in the frequently asked questions document. Additionally, any questions that were emailed uh, to the research underscore ideal address will also be answered in that document. So Austin, when will we be releasing that document so people can keep their eyes out for it? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, we're looking at by the end of the week is our target uh, for releasing that. But obviously, we've got a few more questions that we need to think through and make sure we get that all out to you. Um, I say thank you for your patience. We are figuring some of this out as we go. That's why we can't always answer your question definitively, but we will by Friday. So stay yeah. tuned. Mm -hmm. And people have been asking about a recording. And yes, the recording of this presentation will be made available, um, will be posted as well this week. Um, so you can rewatch or share. Before you leave, we'd really appreciate your input on the event. And we have a link that is being going to be shared in the chat box with a short valuation. It'll just take one minute. We really value the impact, value your insights, and hope to improve future webinars. So thank you again. I appreciate you taking the time to join us today and complete that evaluation.